I just have a quick announcement for the faculty. So the faculty meeting should have been on Wednesday afternoon, but instead it will be tomorrow, Tuesday, over lunch. So if you are faculty or you think you should participate to the faculty meeting, uh, there will be a table somewhere on the terrace uh, where people will eat uh, and uh, be faculty. Uh, I think we can start with the second session. This uh, will be about quantitative immunology and uh, signaling. And the first speaker is uh, Giacomo Frangipane, who will take a, a talk about uh, light control motility in uh, engineered Escherichia coli. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm not going to speak about uh, immunology today, but still uh, we have bacteria here. And in, in, um, in particular, I'm going to speak about E. coli. Why E. coli? Because we know more on E. coli than on uh, any other organism in the world. And so, uh, thanks to the, the development of molecular biology, today we can engineer this cell and uh, introduce new, new function in it uh, easily. And we can think about it uh, as a computer where we can write new software by, uh, by introducing DNA inside, uh, uh, inside it. So why we're inter interested in E. coli also? Because uh, it is an excellent microswimmer. It can propel itself uh, uh, in a low Reynolds, war uh, re low Reynolds number world thanks to the rotation of a bundle of flagella. And this is possible uh, thanks to the flagellar motor. The flagellar motor is this marvelous macro machine developed by Evolution that works at nearly 100% uh, efficiency and it's able to uh, translate an electrochemical gradient related to proton, the, the PMF, into a net movement. Uh, this proton-motive force, the PM, PMF, uh, in general, uh, we know from literature that is uh, uh, proportional to the swimming speed of the cells. And it's going to be an important concept uh, uh, along the, uh, the, my, my talk. In general, it is uh, powered by, uh, PM, PMF is powered by glucose, oxygen, or other kind of nutrients. But if we cut them off from uh, the suspension of our bacteria, the cell stops to swim, the motor stops. However, uh, what we can do is uh, uh, transform a plasmid in our bacteria, make them express an exogenous protein, the, proton uh, the proterodopsin. This is a light-driven proton pump. And this uh, light-driven proton pump can receive a photon to uh, charge the PMF. And so by shining light on a suspension of this bacteria, we can make them move again using light. Moreover, by uh, controlling the intensity of light that we are uh, shining on our suspension, we can also control the speed. Um, well, well, what we can do with uh, this kind of bacteria, this particle whose speed can be controlled with light? We know from theory that uh, a density of a suspe um, um, the isotropic, uh, if we have an isotropic random walk with space-dependent speed, the density uh, of suspension of uh, the particle that have this kind of random walk uh, distribute uh, with a uh, density that is uh, inversely proportional to the, to the speed, the, the local speed. And since we can control locally the speed using light, thanks to uh, a projector that we can couple to uh, our microscope, we can also control spatially the density uh, of our bacteria. What we decided to do is uh, we shined a complex pattern uh, on a suspension of this bacteria. We shined the, the inverse pattern, a negative image of the Mona Lisa painting from Leonardo. Leonardo is the name of this building also. And... Uh, by shining the, this pattern of suspension of this kind of bacteria, they uh, move in space and they uh, form the, uh, the image of the Mona Lisa. However, our bacteria when, were not responding uh, instantaneously to the change in light, but they were taking a while. And so to uh, improve uh, uh, our density control, what we did, we introduced a feedback algorithm that allowed us to have this kind of control and uh, this is the size of one millimeter under uh, our microscope. 
Uh, in parallel, another group in Edinburgh was working uh, on a similar kind of system. They were able to improve uh, this uh, uh, time uh, uh, response. So these bacteria respond pretty quickly, less than one second. And they were able to demonstrate uh, that uh, the, um, the relationship, uh, that the density is uh, inverse to the uh, inverse proportional to the in, uh, to the speed is is uh, is true and uh, but in all this uh, experiment uh, we both were using uh, smooth swimmer bacteria so bacteria were, were not tumbling usually bacteria uh, do run and tumble they go straight and then sometimes they tumble and they reorient themselves in space uh, along another direction what they observed is that by using uh, tumbling bacteria and expre expressing protodopsin in tumbling bacteria, bacteria, rather than accumulating uh, where they go slow, they accumulate where they go fast. So what is happening here? So no now I'm going to speak only of bacteria that can also tumble. So they have some form of uh, tactic, taxis. You can see uh, here, uh, um, a video with a suspension of bacteria swimming, and, uh, and we are turning uh, uh, light from um, on and off from between, on, between two levels of intensity of light. What we observed is that when there are the circles, the light is turned uh, down and the bacteria tumble. So in response to uh, a decrease in the light intensity, we don't only have a decrease in the speed, but we have also a tumble. This, is, this can be seen a bit as uh, um, an energy taxis effect, where the energy that the cell can perceive is the protomotive force. The protomotive force uh, uh, is related to the metabolism, so uh, it's, the, it's a form of an uh, energy taxis. And uh, we have that uh, um, the tumbling rate transiently uh, uh, change when there is a uh, change in the intensity of light and so in the ambient mass. Uh, cells in, uh, e. coli cells in general have receptors to sense this internal state of the cell, and uh, electron transport activity, the cellular expansion, and also the protomotive force. So through light, we can control the protomotive force, and the motive force affect both the speed and the tumbling rate of our bacteria. We can quantify uh, how the tumbling rate uh, changes in time by um, displaying uh, a square wave uh, of light uh, on our bacteria in time and uh, uh, by quantifying the rate of change of direction of our bacteria. So how quickly they are, they are orienting in space. And we have that uh, um, Unfortunately, here there should be a fit with this model that, that assumes that uh, the tumbling rate changes uh, uh, according to this linear response theory that is typical, uh, typically used with bacter for bacteria, where we have uh, a response uh, kernel that uh, uh, we assume to be only two exponentials, the sum of two exponentials. And uh, the, in, uh, in this kernel, uh, two uh, time scale appears. The, uh, a time scale uh, of less than one second that is related to the sensing of the change of light, and one uh, scale that is related to the adaptation to the new, ne new level of light. So we saw that there are two effects. Uh, the photokinesis effect related to speed and make them accumulate in the dark, and so it's a sort of photophobic effect and a uh, phototactic effect that make them accumulate in the light, where their uh, protomotive force is higher, so they have more energy. What we did is uh, we built a model based uh, on uh, that uh, tumbling behavior that we saw before, the uh, run and tumble model, uh, classical run and tumble model, and we assume that they are moving in a, a profile pattern with a speed that is uh, cosinusoidal, so that we can analytically solve this model. And uh, we could uh, derive so the uh, stationary density in uh, this situation, where this uh, uh, gamma is the phototactic coefficient. It, it tells us how much is important uh, uh, the, um, the 
photo uh, taxis in, uh, in, a, in our uh, in when the bacteria swim in that pattern of light with a certain frequency uh, changing in space. Uh, we have by changing gamma that if if um, we have a slowly changing pattern, gamma is big, and so it dominates the uh, photo uh, the photophilic effect and accumulating the light. While if the pattern is changing quickly, we have that the bacteria uh, behave mainly uh, photokinetically and they accumulate in the dark. Uh, we did the experiment, shining different uh, patterns uh, with different frequency. Uh, we could uh, track uh, the speed in, a, in this suspension of bacteria. We, could uh, we can uh, quantify the density in all the, the experiments. And uh, from this, we, we could fit, the fit all the parameters that were displayed in the previous slide. And uh, we, you can observe that there is a transition from a, a photophilic effect on the left to a phototactic effect on the right, where, where bacteria accumulate in the dark. Uh, we can uh, then uh, estimate, uh, by fitting all this profile, uh, estimate the the phototactic coefficient uh, in all the different uh, experiments for all the uh, different uh, waves. And uh, we could fit also here all the experimental data with uh, uh, the, our experimental model. And we observed that by fitting just one parameter, the tumbling rate uh, at rest, let's say in, uh, when the cell is adapted, that the, the model uh, behaves pretty well and describes our data and uh, predict this transition from the photophilic uh, effect to the photophobic effect increasing uh, the Q of uh, the pattern. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, thanks to all the organizers uh, for this wonderful uh, conference. And, uh, Do you have any questions? To the speaker? Okay, we have a question. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, a, a small comment. When you speak about 100% efficiency, actually it's the Stokes efficiency, it's not the thermodynamic efficiency. I think there one should underline this point. Um, and then in the question, um, can you exp do you have a mechanistic picture of this energy taxis uh, that uh, induces the tumble when uh, lights go on off, or the rhodopsin is uh, turned off. And have you tried to do the other way around? So something like to look what happens when you have small pulses of, of light and then long periods of uh, off. And third question, uh, can you comment on the, um, Recruitment, the recruitment of stator units uh, on the BFM. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I think the second question and the third questions are related uh, in some way. So, we don't want to introduce uh, in our samples also this uh, recruitment of stator. So, we try to be more in a situation in which uh, um, but the stator number stays more or less the same. Uh, when we want to control the tumbling rate uh, in, in, uh, in time. Uh, for, when, for when we're shining a pattern, uh, we, we, uh, we didn't introduce it in the model, and so, uh, but still it's working pretty well. Probably it's gonna change the time scales uh, of the responses. Uh, about the first question, uh, we are trying to, we don't have a mechanism, a model that describes uh, what is going on inside the, the cells. We are trying to delete all the receptors and all the chemotaxis uh, protein uh, and see uh, how they affect the response to the cell, of the cell. So maybe we'll know after these experiments. Okay, thanks again for uh, your talk. Go on.
with the following speaker. Uh, no, wait. Next speak will be held by uh, Andrea Mazzolini about uh, temporal anticorrelation between HIV evolution and B cell response. Uh, I don't see my presentation actually. Yeah, I, I sent it to you. HIV menu no vedete questo però forse seleziona prima la mia window no view ok thanks so I would like to talk about this work I did in Paris with Alexandra Falcia and Thierry Mora So in general, in my postdoc, I, I am interested in the coevolution between immune system and pathogens in general. And here we focus on uh, HIV. And um, so HIV is a pretty, pretty special virus, a pretty special system. So um, as you probably all know, this virus has a very high mutation rate. So basically, it's able to significantly evolve, uh, find mutation, find new variants within a patient during the disease. And so that's also the, the key that makes the virus very hard to defeat. Uh, so there is this kind of evolution. At the same time, also, you have to imagine that the immune system is evolving, trying to uh, bind to the pathogen. So at the level of B-cell receptors, there is a sort of evolutionary process going on to find good antibodies, good receptor that will produce antibodies that will bind to the virus. So we have these two populations evolving together, li like talking with, with each other in an, anti an antagonistic way. So that's the kind of system we are interested in. And uh, we start from data, so sequencing data. Uh, in this data set, we have like uh, sequences of the virus in time of a given patient. So the sequences in general, they change, they have new mutations, new variants. And what's special of this data set is that not only we have the virus, we also have the sequences of the receptors. So this is quite uh, unique. We, we, this is the only data set we know that has this, the, the, the sequences uh, of the two populations are present. And so starting from here, Okay, also we have like different patients, 10 patients, we have different time points for several years. Uh, starting from here, we focus on a kind of simple quantity. So imagining that we have sequences of time one, sequences of time two. Uh, these sequences can be of the virus, can be also of the receptors. We can count mutations. So for example, uh, mutation A, position one. And for each mutation, we can count frequencies uh, that mutation are present in the, in the, two, in the two time points. Uh, now, uh, we want to somehow quantify how much the genetic composition of the population of the sequences is changing between the two time points. So basically, for each mutation, we have the frequency at the two time points, we compute the difference in frequencies in absolute value, and we sum all those variations, all these absolute changes of frequencies. So at the end, we have just a single number that quantifies how much the, 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 the population is accumulating mutation between the two time points that we call genetic turnover. 
So what we observe uh, is a statistically significant signal. So basically we can compute this for HIV, we can compute this for immune system. And at the end we find that there is an anti-correlation in time of this genetic turnover that was quite surprising for us. So this anti-correlation in genetic turnover means that when the, the virus is not changing much, the immune system is changing a lot and uh, the opposite, so, or, or the opposite. So that when the virus is changing a lot, the immune system is not changing much. Actually, at the beginning, we were expecting the opposite. But so we, we, we like, uh, try to build a model to like, explain this signal, to build a bit of intuition on that. And uh, the model is based on previous work and just the quick idea. We model the virus and the uh, receptors are string of plus and minus one. We have an affinity for how good uh, each string, uh, the, the, the antibody can bite to the virus. And so from the affinity, we can build fitnesses. And so with all this kind of machinery, we can run simulation and we can compute the turnover. And what we get at the end are basically, let's say, two results. Uh, so if we choose somehow mutation rate, uh, population size like, that are like bi biologically reasonable, we get back the signal. So we get back the negative correlation. And if we like simplify the model as much as possible, basically we can get a little bit of intuition why this correlation can emerge. And it's kind of related with how the time scale, the time uh, for sampling the trajectory, the experimental sampling time, so how, 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 how much time there is between two time points in the experiment relates with the typical time the mutation takes to sweep. So like in this simple setting, we can make sense of the negative correlation in this sense. And, uh, if you are interested, you can ask me questions or uh, go to the paper, and uh, I, would, I thank you for the attention. Uh, does your mother assume constant population sizes? Because they, I guess in the in a okay, the, situation they could... Uh, the, um, the affinity maturation, in general, is not necessarily true that there is constant population size. What we are assuming here is that there are these lineages of B cells that are not new. So they are like a sort of stationary state and the kind of number of antibodies in the affinity maturation somehow stays constant, number of receptors. Uh, so as I'm sure you, you know, your group uses this uh, sort of exponential cross-reactivity profile. Do you have enough data in HIV to see how accurate that is in terms of average distance away that you have to mutate to maintain? In, a, in our model, we don't include cross-reactivity. In just, our model, I mean, you assume, you assume one mutation is enough to destroy. Uh, in, in our model, we just dis disaffinity. So I mean. The, the closer you are to the sequence, uh, the, the, the faster you will grow for, for, the, for the immune system. But so how fast? I mean, in other words, the, yeah, the closer, the faster. Yeah, the and, the and then there is a... a, 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 a have some idea. I'm just asking whether in the HIV data there's any information about how fast that falls off as a function of uh, genomic distance. If you know, maybe you don't uh, know. Okay, I, I know in general for flu, for example, people believe that the average distance is around a, a few amino acids. So it can go until, I think, 10 amino acid distance. But I mean, it's a ex ex sort of exponentially decaying function. I think it's a few amino acid distance. Then, yeah. Thanks again for the interesting talk. Go on with the following talk. We have uh, Matthew Connell, who will have a talk about uh, uh, T cell. Uh, T cell activation and its uh, effect on chromatin and uh, nuclear architecture. <laughs> Sorry. Oh wait, how do I get back to <laughs> how do I get back to this folder? I think I got it. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Matthew Cannell and uh, <laughs> As I said, I'm looking into nuclear architecture change as a result of T cell activation. Uh, I'm in the University of Maryland biophysics program. So T cells are part of the adaptive immune system which recognize specific antigenic peptide and target specific uh, cells which are, are you know, showing that peptide, uh, directly engaging with them. And during this engagement, they change uh, cytoskeleton organization significantly as they perform their cytotoxic activity. And the nucleus also deforms significantly. 
And this nuclear change that occurs during activation is what I'm focused on. So nucleus uh, uh, contains DNA organized as chromatin, and this is organized dynamically on many levels uh, in, in all situations. And so from small histone interactions to large-scale domain interactions, uh, the nucleus changes in response to different things. Um, specifically, uh, I'm interested in post-translational modifications to histones, which uh, in this case uh, may make the chromatin more dense and more transcriptionally silenced as heterochromatin. Uh, and that also may impact the distribution of these chromatin regions. So I'm focused on a few different things. Um, th this is kind of an overview of some different research that we're, we're going through now. Um, how does the T cell activation alter chromatin organization? How do modifications in the nucleus uh, under activation change the dynamics of chromatin? And how uh, does the extracellular microenvironment also alter the nucleus during activation? And uh, potentially in the future, focusing more on gene expression as a result of this as well. So uh, as of now, um, there is definitely an impact uh, of activation on the large-scale nuclear properties, such as nuclear spreading on the left there, where an activated cell spreads much more and the nucleus spreads out, and the amount of heterochromatin present in that cell, which is marked here in an immunofluorescence experiment with uh, heterochromatin H3K27ME3. Um, and so both of these are changed by an activating uh, cover slip versus a non-activating. And so looking less into structure and more in dynamics, uh, you can track the individual motion of different chromatin loci that are, uh, this case, telomeres labeled fluorescently. Um, and you can see that by tracking the motion of these, we can look into chromatin mobility and how that is, is dynamically changing uh, in response to activation. Here, you can see that the activating cell, the activating uh, jerkat T cell in this case, has more dynamic telomeres on the short scale. Um, we can also see how that changes as a result of alterations to the heterochromatin amount. So in this case, DZNEP is a treatment to reduce heterochromatin, and it also reduces short-scale telomere dynamics. Um, this is also very scale-dependent, which I don't have time to get into. Um, so now going into the external microenvironment, we, uh, T cells interact with a lot of different tissues and cells, and those have many different stiffnesses. So we try to mimic that with glass and gels of different stiffnesses. And that significantly impacts how the nucleus uh, spreads out, in this case, spreads out much more on stiff substrates. Um, and also, it impacts the amount of heterochromatin that is developing and where it is distributed. You can see for stiffer substrates, we have more heterochromatin that seems to be expressed, as well as more peripheral heterochromatin. By taking the ratio of the fluorescence on the outside to the inside, you can see more peripherally distributed heterochromatin. Um, in the future, we're going to focus a lot, uh, on the movement of individual histones within cell lines and primary cells um, to investigate how those small-scale interactions are occurring and transcriptional accessibility. And then also we want to look into the flow of chromatin itself, sort of how that dynamics occurs, not just on individual loci, but within all chromatin. All right, I'd like to thank all my collaborators and uh, coworkers, and thank you. Uh, is there any question? Okay. So the activation occurs over uh, maybe 10 minutes, the initial activation response, but then over many hours uh, you express different proteins um, and sort of the cytotoxic activity actually occurs. So it does, we are looking into how the nucleus changes on those scales as well, because this transcriptional accessibility is sort of a long-term, many hours, many days sort of process. Yeah, thank you. Thanks again for the presentation. We'll talk after. Yep. <laughs> okay. The next speaker, Alexander Moffitt. So, yeah, I'm Alex Moffitt. Uh, I'm coming from Northeastern University in Boston uh, in the U.S. Uh, and this has nothing to do with 
quantitative immunology. Well, something to do with it probably, but not directly. Uh, so uh, what we're looking at is uh, duplications of genes, um, specifically large duplications. So uh, oftentimes you can have uh, blocks of genes that are duplicated together. So if you have an ancestral genome um, and there's a speciation event, um, in one of the uh, resulting species, uh, if we see a duplication of a block of genes, um, for example here from chromosome 2 into chromosome 1, um, we end up with uh, two genomes, one that looks uh, an awful lot like the ancestral genome and the other that um, has a, a block of genes uh, duplicated into a uh, sort of unfamiliar context. So we can, um, we can identify these, uh, these types of duplications by comparing pairs of genomes. So um, basically these dots represent uh, relatedness of genes, homology between genes um, in these two organisms. Um, and we identify uh, regions of conserved gene order. And, uh, and then we can see uh, here that uh, this is the original sort of ancestral context for, for these three genes that have been duplicated. And out here uh, is a region of conserved order which is representing um, out of context uh, genes in chromosome, uh, in organism A here. So why are we interested in this? Well, um, there's a long standing hypothesis uh, which has uh, some degree of evidence or a, a decent bit of evidence for it. Um, but um, so basically genes that are in the ancestral context, um, we expect them to evolve more slowly. Basically, they have the regulatory elements that they need around them, uh, and so they're functional. And uh, genes that have been inserted into a foreign context, uh, we expect to evolve more quickly um, because they're, they're less likely to uh, be regulated properly and there's likely less selection on the, uh, on the genes. So uh, what we want to do is really test this hypothesis on a huge data set, uh, or at least I think it's pretty big. Uh, so we have 200 mammalian genomes um, that we're looking at. And what we're doing is these pairwise comparisons of genomes, uh, identifying duplications, and uh, trying to figure out uh, whether this rate of evolution is actually faster for uh, uh, the copies of, of duplications that are out of context. Um, and we have a lot of uh, results on this, but I figured I would just put this little <laughs> diagram here. And it, we actually have found a lot of evidence for this, uh, uh, this uh, that, that this is true, actually, that the rate of evolution is um, faster for the uh, out-of-context uh, copies of, of genes. Um, and I can tell you, if you're interested in this, you can talk to me after, and I can show you the actual, uh, actual analysis we've done here. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I wanted to thank Michele Di Piero, uh, who's my advisor on this, and Andrea Falcone, who uh, I'm working with on this project. That's it. Um, is there any evidence that the, um, the rate of uh, mutations depends on how recently the displacement occurred? Uh, well, that's actually, yeah, it's a really interesting thing, because you might expect, uh, you might expect uh, sort of adaptation around the genes for yeah, regulatory elements. I don't know, but uh, it's something we definitely want to look into. And that's a big part of our work, is figuring out when these duplications happened, and when we do that, we can, we can try to figure that out. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh Yeah, I mean, uh, 
Well, so I, I think I'm not sure I quite understood, but we, we don't we don't have really data on, on uh, uh, transcriptional activity, so we sort of have to use these as proxies. I don't know if that's... Okay, no, because so. uh, like, uh, genes mutate, they think it was a regulation, but it's a uh, because leaps forward, like, that's uh, uh, I'm not sure uh, you have data to say that. Oh, yeah, sure. It, it, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's not, uh, we, there could be other reasons as well. I mean, if this, you know, we've, we're finding uh, evidence for this, that's one explanation, right? Is that uh, if genes are copied out of context, they don't have their cis regulatory elements uh, oops, sorry, uh, nearby, uh, and so transcription is messed up. We don't have any direct evidence for that. You're right. Um, but that's one explanation. Yeah. Okay. We're, <clears throat> we're a bit late with the schedule. Uh, maybe we can keep questions for the next break. And uh, welcome uh, Ariel Amir, next uh, speaker, who will have a talk uh, about diffusive relays and how they stop. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, so most of the work in my group is uh, modeling uh, microbial growth and division, like we heard in the first session. Uh, but today I'll talk about something very different, collective effects uh, in the human immune system. And I'll introduce, uh, I'll define what the diffusive, diffusive releases are uh, in a second. Uh, so this talk is about neutrophils. And uh, for the physicists in the audience unfamiliar, uh, these are the most abundant white blood cells uh, found across species, including uh, our own bodies. They're the initial immune responders um, that uh, cause inflammation. And so, for example, here, this is a wound inflicted by laser on the tail of a zebrafish. And you can see the red cells uh, accumulating relatively quickly at the injury site within the course of tens of minutes. And uh, this project started uh, uh, when I learned about these experiments doing something similar in vitro. This is work from Daniel Iremea's group at Harvard Medical School. And he has this microfluidic uh, device uh, where you take, uh, in this case, it's a yeast infection, so it's heat-killed yeast, and you take blood, uh, neutrophils from uh, human blood, from donors, and you can see a very similar phenomenology. Uh, within tens of minutes, these accumulate uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the infection, at the yeast infection. And uh, if you analyze this video, you can plot uh, time on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, take a, a, a circle of radius r around the target, and ask, do the cells here know where to go to? So you can take a cosine of their angle relative to the radial direction and average it. And if cells are moving randomly, you'll get something close to zero. So this corresponds to this white and light blue. But to the right of this information front, cells are moving radially inwards in a consistent way. And you can see something important. There is a time scale separation between the tens of minutes to recruit the cells and the couple of minutes it takes the information uh, to spread across uh, the field of view. And this will be important uh, later on. And it's a uh, long thought that LTD4 is the signaling molecule that recruits these neutrophils. So the picture is cells at the site uh, uh, start uh, uh, secreting LTD4 that diffuses and recruit cells from, from far away. Uh, but for those who remember something about diffusion, uh, there is a problem with this picture. Because we know that the hallmark of diffusion is that the length scale scales as square root of the time. And if you take the diffusion constant of a small molecule like LTB4 and ask how long uh, uh, until it takes to recruit from a millimeter away, you get a prohibitively long time of a couple of hours inconsistent uh, with the experiments. And Furthermore, if you look at the shape of this information front that I showed in the previous slide, uh, diffusion would predict the square root of time dependence, so something concave, while the data showed something convex. So that's another problem. And so we thought maybe what's going on is that cells, uh, when they uh, sense LTB4, not only starts uh, moving towards the target, but also starts secreting LTB4 themselves, becoming sources of, of uh, LTB4, and in that way create what we call a diffusive relay. Um, and what we expect is that uh, uh, the time it would uh, take to traverse a millimeter is ab about 10 minutes, uh, so the velocity of these waves should be of the order of microns uh, per second. 
And uh, what I'll tell you about uh, now very quickly is uh, uh, the properties of these diffusive relays, and in particular the effects of dimensionality and the, the, uh, cell discreteness. And this was work of Paul Dieterle. Uh, and, uh, and in the second part about uh, an exciting, uh, in our opinion, feature of these waves, the fact that they have to stop at some point. And this is uh, modeling was done by Deng Pan, a current uh, PhD student at Harvard. And, and so here is the model. Um, so the time derivative of the, the concentration of LTB4, in addition to the diffusive component, <coughs> now has these contributions from single cells. So the cells uh, sense LTB4 and emit in response. And so if A is the maximal emission rate and F of C is this function describing uh, the dependence of secretion on the measured concentration, and this can be uh, anything uh, you want, um, you have to sum over these, every cell acts as a point source. And now if we take the continuum limit of this equation, and I'll get back to this point later on, it's actually a subtle procedure, it's not always uh, justified, one obtains this reaction diffusion equation uh, where this is the uh, nonlinearity introduced by the secretion of the cells. Okay, so if we analyze this equation first in a, a, a symmetrically, spherically symmetric setting, so imagine cells in 2D and diffusion occurring in 2D, or cells in 3D and diffusion occurring in 3D, um, it's kind of standard procedure. You can go to the right Laplacian in spherical coordinates. You can surf with a wave, so guess a traveling wave solution, and write the equation uh, in the moving frame. And if you do that, you reduce this partial differential equation to an ordinary differential equation, and you learn something interesting, you see that this term is the only one that depends on the dimensionality, capital N is the dimensionality of the system, and you can see that far away from the source, uh, this R dependence would make this term va vanish or negligible compared to this term. And so we learn that when we're far away and how far uh, uh, you see an emergent length scale that will appear again and again in this talk, it's the diffusion constant divided by the wave velocity, when you're that far away from the source, you don't know that the Earth is round, and you can uh, obtain an equation that is completely independent of the dimensionality of the system. Now, if we analyze this equation, for example, uh, let's take the scenario where f of c is a step function, meaning cells start emitting LTB4 at maximal volume uh, when they reach a critical concentration. Uh, this is the sort of, uh, you can analyze this uh, reminiscence of undergrad uh, quantum mechanics uh, exercises, and you will find by matching the, uh, the, bound, the, the uh, conditions to the right and left of the propagating wave front, that the velocity scales as square root of density times diffusion constant, and this is, makes sense because it's a collective effect. It has to depend on the density of the neutrophils. And in fact, you could have reached this conclusion from dimensional analysis alone, just by uh, seeing what, you can, uh, what can create something with dimensions of velocity. But in fact, in the experiments, this is not the geometry we have. In the experiments, we have cells in, on a 2D surface above which there is a practically infinite uh, space. So diffusion of LTB4 is occurring in three dimensions. And we can add that again to the equation by this additional delta function. We can analyze it uh, along the same vein, but, uh, but also we can reach this conclusion from dimensional analysis. And the result is rather surprising. In this case, the velocity scales as the emission rate times density divided by the threshold and is independent of the diffusion constant. So we have a diffusive relay driven by diffusion, but creating a wave with the velocity of which is completely independent of the diffusion constant, which came as a surprise uh, to us. And, um, and again, you can ask, are, is the thickness of the device sufficient uh, to justify this 2D embedded in 3D? And again, you should compare thickness with this emergent length scale of D over V that for the experiments is of the order of 10 microns. The thickness of the device is a millimeter, so you're well within uh, this uh, regime. Okay, so to summarize so far, I showed you that when the dimension of diffusion is equal to the dimension that the cells are in, you get this square root uh, density dependence. When there is a mismatch of one, you get this weird result of a velocity independent of the diffusion. And if the mismatch is larger, we can show that the, you cannot support any waves. There are no traveling waves uh, solutions. And when we look at the experiments, like we said, this is cells on 2D surface, diffusion in 3D, 
and you can fit the parameters uh, 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 based on the data, and you get a diffusion constant consistent with a small molecule like LTB4, and you measure a concentration threshold uh, very consistent with the dissociation constant of the LTB4 uh, receptor. I want to say uh, if quick words about the continuum approximation. So, so far, I use this uh, continuum description, but in fact, uh, like I said before, this is the correct result where you uh, sum over delta functions, and you can ask, when is this justified? And I won't go into this in depth, but again, you won't be surprised. Cells have to be close enough to each other compared to this emergent scale of D over V. And we know how, not, how the velocity scales on dimensionality. And when we do that uh, in one dimension, you, you get a dimensionless parameter. This is the small parameter for the continuum approximation to hold. And the denser cells are, the better the continuum approximation is. This is in line of everybody's intuition, I think. But when we do the same in three dimensions, we get the opposite. This is the parameter that should be small for the continuum approximation to hold, and it gets better as cells get further and further apart. So for a 3D system, the more dilute the system is, the better the continuum approximation is. And if we look at the, at the case of the experiments, they're again 2D embedded in 3D, and the relevant dimensionless parameter is indeed small, meaning everything I said so far and the use of the continuum approximation is justified for the experiments. And now I want to talk about a, a recent work in, now in press, uh, together with the Ryan Weiner's uh, group at UCSF. And uh, like I said so far, the, the readout for knowing if cells have been activated or not, uh, you needed to look at the cells and whether they're moving radially in. And because of the time scale separation, the fact that the cell velocity is much smaller than the wave velocity, this was not the best uh, readout for the sort of experiments. And what Ryan's group brought was calcium imaging that immediately tells us whether cells have sensed LD before and participate in the relay or not. And that allows us to visualize uh, the waves uh, in much, much better accuracy. So you can see these are four yeast targets, and you can see these explosions, uh, literally the diffusive relays being uh, initiated and triggered uh, at each of these, uh, I'll show this again, at each of these uh, uh, four sites. And this opens uh, the way to a much more quantitative analysis of the diffusive relays. And so the first thing we did was really confirm that this is working. So we can see here that cells inside the waves are moving radially in, while cells outside uh, the observed wave uh, have a basically a zero radial velocity. They're just jiggling around. And this is again showing that the wave uh, front travels an order of magnitude faster compared to the radial uh, velocity of the migrating waves. Um, and next, we wanted to see, is this really a relay? Does it behave like we uh, uh, predict? And Feynman has a famous quote, what we cannot create, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And we're going to flip this, and what I cannot break, I do not understand. Um, so you all know that uh, uh, for, for diffusion, R squared scales as time. And so if we break the relay, we expect that the distance squared, where distance is the distance uh, traveled by the wavefront, should scale instead of a T squared dependence, this is what we expect for a relay, but become linear in T if we break the relay. How do we break the relay? We add a, a, an antagonist. A, 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 we basically block the LTB4 receptors. Okay? And what you see here, here is an example of one experiment. Um, for normal uh, blood, you get an exponent of two corresponding to a, a wave tra traveling at constant velocity. When we block the LTB4 receptor, the exponent becomes uh, close to one. When we repeat this uh, over many experiments, we see consistently that uh, the average exponent changes from something close to two uh, to something close to one, meaning that indeed these are diffusive relays and we can uh, also destroy them. Now, so far I discussed uh, waves that if initiated, <gasps> propagate forever. And this is the case for other models, including Fisher waves, for those familiar with it, uh, uh, waves uh, uh, in the context uh, of uh, dictyocilium that Herbie Levine here did nice work on, and others. And what we realize is that the immune system poses an interesting challenge. If I have a small cut on my hand, I don't want to recruit all the neutrophils from my body to the, to the wound. So it must be 
that the waves uh, should propagate uh, only to a limited extent. So we ask ourselves, can we construct and test models that have finite extension? And uh, after a lot of uh, uh, dead ends, uh, we came up with, uh, with this simple model. So what we have here, uh, L is the LTV4 concentration. It still diffuses and it still is produced in a relay form with this theta function corresponding to producing LTB4 when you're above a, a threshold. But now the production can be turned off by an inhibitor R, okay? And R, the inhibitor, doesn't diffuse. I'll, I'll explain why in a second, but basically this means it's intracellular and, and its production itself is being driven by the LTB4. Okay, so this is the minimal model, and what it would lead to, as I'll show you in a second, is a relay that starts propagating, but then the inhibitor starts eating up the wave at the back of the wave, and the re th this regime uh, penetrates deeper and deeper into the wave until it shuts it off completely. And so there are two regimes for this model. There is a regime of persistent waves that propagate forever, uh, but then, I'll show this again, in the right parameter regime, you see this is the LTB4 front, and it's being turned off very abruptly uh, at a certain point when the inhibitor catches up with it. And we can analyze this mathematically. When do you get this uh, self-extinguishing waves? And again, this D over V length scale emerges. I won't get into this for the sake of time. Um, we validated that you get the same when you work with discrete simulations. This is because of the subtlety of the continuum approximation that I showed you in the first part of the talk. Um, the model captures well both the shape and the dynamics uh, of the wavefront. Um, but, but really the proof of this is, uh, um, like I said before, what I cannot break I do not understand. So we wanted to break uh, the self-extinguishing nature of the relay. So how, do, how should we do that? We, in this case, we target the inhibitor and we want to block the inhibitor. So we've identified the inhibitor as an a, 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 a NADPH oxidase and there is a known drug, DPI, uh, that targets it. So what I'll show you now are uh, waves that in the normal blood, you can see here, propagate and stop. And now with the addition of DPI, we basically wave, get waves that uh, continue throughout the field of view uh, uh, unhindered. And in fact, we did it in another way, not using a drug, but using blood from uh, uh, donors that have a disease called CGD, known to be impaired for this particular inhibitor, and you get the same uh, phenomenology. So to summarize, I showed you that diff diffusive relays allow cells to respond rapidly and with strong gradients that allow for efficient chemotaxis. I showed you a strong de dependence on the system dimensionality, and in particular, the wave velocity depends on the dimensionality difference between the dimensions the cells are in and the dimension diffusion takes place in. I showed you rather counterintuitive results for the validity of the continuum approximation, uh, as well as new models for self-extinguishing waves uh, with testable predictions. This was a really nice uh, collaboration for me because it was an example of uh, the usual feedback loop of experiments that led to theory that led to more experiments and we're still continuing uh, with, the, with the next phase uh, of theory and experiments. Uh, and in addition, it leads to these beautiful uh, videos that uh, uh, to me uh, always remind of the fireworks. Uh, and, uh, and with that, I'll end. Thanks for your attention. We have a question here. So I may have asked you this already, but have you worked out the stability of your waves when you actually include the motion of the cells as part of the dynamics? Let me, the, the first paper I ever wrote about biology was about how if you do the same thing for dictostelium, you find waves that last forever, as you said, but also you find an instability that drives them into streams as opposed to a collapsing symmetric front, and here you didn't see that. So have you understood what the difference is? So the short answer is no. It's a, it's a, we're starting to, but we're not there yet. Uh, when you visited Weizmann a couple of months ago, you had an, a, a, 
a suggestion to look at uh, colliding waves. So I'll show you a result from a, from a couple of uh, days ago. Uh, uh, this is a video we haven't analyzed yet, but I think it's a, you'll be interested in that. So these are experiments by Daniel Yermera. Where now we have a huge target. So all of this, there is a rectangle uh, uh, of yeast infection. And uh, I think there is a lot of information here. Uh, you, you will see a lot of colliding waves, uh, which is the question you ask me, how do these waves collide with each other and so on. So soon you will see these explosions and you see a lot of... So I think there is a ton of quantitative information here. And so so we're, we're starting with that as well. Okay, we have time just for uh, another quick question. Uh, thank you for that talk. I, I, I apologize because I think you already uh, explained this, but I was hoping you could say one more time um, the, the sort of the intuition for why it is that the, de uh, the, the uh, dependence on uh, dimensionality disappears in the case of the uh, 2D embedded in 3D geometry. Um, so you're asking why the diffusion constant disappears from the velocity? So actually, I didn't give intuition for that because I don't have uh, intuition for that. Uh, when, when I spoke to a colleague from, uh, you know, an experimentalist from quantum optics, he said, you know, it kind of makes sense because, you know, you have two competing effects. On one hand, uh, the diffusion makes you faster in going from one cell to the nearby cell. But on the other hand, because diffusion is fast, you lose molecules, signal molecules, to the perpendicular direction. So that's a hand wave. I wouldn't call it intuition because it doesn't explain why there is an exact cancellation between these two effects. So I throw it out to the theorist in the audience. If you have intuition that explains this without doing the calculation, I'd love to, uh, to hear because I feel it's, uh, I'm lacking it. Thanks. Thanks again, Ariel. And Pio, or Pio, I don't know the pronunciation. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Pio. I'm a, a PhD candidate at Princeton University, and today I'll be talking about uh, our recent work thinking about uh, B-cell affinity maturation. And so, just to, sorry, it's not showing. Oh, oh it's not showing. Ooh. Okay. okay, there we go, okay. Good, thank you. Um, yeah, so start to kind of set the tone right, I think it's fair to say that we live in kind of a dangerous world um, in, in the sense that, you know, every day in our everyday lives, it, we're always uh, bombarded by viruses, bacteria, toxins. Um, and, of course, a dramatic example of that was the recent COVID pandemic uh, that have shut down the world. Uh, but it, it is incredible that our bodies, despite this um, wide variety of um, pathogens that we uh, run into every day, is able to protect uh, we have a system to protect ourselves against that. And of course, a lot of that has to do with our immune system. And luckily, we've had really nice introductions on both parts of the immune system. Um, but in general, there's the innate, innate immune system, which is more broad and nonspecific, uh, like the neutrophils that was talked about in the last um, talk. And there's also the specialized adaptive immune system uh, that deals with more uh, specific, antigen-specific uh, immune response. And you know, the two big players um, in the adaptive immunity are T cells and B cells. And uh, and today I'll be talking about how uh, B cells produce potent antibodies um, through this uh, process called affinity maturation. So just to quickly outline my talk, I'll again talk about this generation of good or potent antibodies, and then I'll kind of introduce uh, a current problem, well, inconsistency in our understanding of uh, certain aspects of affinity maturation, and I'll propose a uh, theoretical solution to that, and then we'll, I'll briefly introduce or show some experimental verifications of the, of the theoretical predictions. Okay, so in general, how do B cells produce antibodies? Well, initially when you're exposed to a pathogen, um, B cells that express B cell receptors that specifically bind uh, to the given pathogen or antigen can be activated through various pathways. Um, and upon activation, these B cells undergo clonal expansion or proliferation. And some of these expanded B cells can then differentiate into specialized cells like plasma cells, uh, which are basically, you can think of as antibody factories that uh, generate and secrete a bunch of antibodies in hopes that these antibodies will now go bind to the pathogen and be able to clear it. Um, so 
In general, at this, you know, I left out a lot of details, but in general, this seems to be consistent, but there is an issue with this very simple picture, and is the fact that because your body, a priori, does not know what new pathogen it's gonna encounter, its general strategy is to keep a broad repertoire of B cells uh, expressing various B cell receptors. And, and so the probability that this initial batch of uh, antibodies will be specific enough or have high enough affinity to the antigen to clear it from your system is quite low. And so fortunately for us, our bodies, have figured out a solution to this problem yet again. And it's this uh, fascinating accelerated Darwinian evolutionary process uh, called affinity maturation. So affinity maturation uh, takes place in these uh, specialized micro compartments called germinal centers, which are located in secondary lymphoid organs. So that's like your lymph nodes and spleen. And so here's a nice uh, image of a cross section of a lymph node and all these colorful lobes, individual lobes are each uh, germinal centers. And and interestingly, uh, our bodies are able to achieve about over a hundredfold increase in the affinity of the antibodies through this, uh, throughout the course of an infection, uh, thanks to affinity maturation. And what's really fascinating for me, at least, is that this affinity maturation process is an extremely dynamic process. So here, T cells are in green, uh, B cells are in blue, and through somehow the swarming, uh, your body's able to organize this very precise, um, specific uh, response to a given antigen. So, how does that actually work? So here's a schematic diagram of affinity maturation, and in general, the germinal center itself is split into two physical compartments called the light zone, where selection occurs, and the dark zone, uh, where division and pro um, proliferation and mutation occurs. And so, in general, you can split up uh, affinity maturation into three main steps. Uh, and the step one is initially you start off with a bunch of B cells that are competing to acquire as much antigen as possible from specialized um, uh, antigen-presenting cells called uh, FTC, or follicular dendritic cells. And upon acquiring or pulling off an antigen from this FTC, B cells will internalize this antigen um, and process it into peptide fragments and present it on its surface as uh, peptide MHC complexes. And simultaneously while this is happening, there are specialized T cells called T follicular helper cells that go around sensing for the presented uh, peptides on B cells. And it will provide a help signal that's proportioned to basically the density of the presented peptides. Um, and that's how it kind of tells relatively how good the given B cell is in the germinal center. And upon receiving a sufficient amount of help signal, the B cell then migrates down to the dark zone, uh, where it will undergo pre-programmed number of divisions while undergoing very high rates of somatic hypermutation on its B cell receptor. And then at the end of that, it returns back into the light zone and continues this iterative cycle of selection, proliferation, and somatic hypermutation, leading to this uh, continual increase in affinity over time. So what's interesting is the best B cells that receive maximal amount of T cell help signal uh, turns out they divide over six times consecutively while um, mutating in the dark zone before re-entering the light zone, which sounds at the surface level pretty good in the sense that, you know, this really uh, increases the effective birth rate. So at the end of the day, it just gives a selective advantage for the best B cells, which is what you want. Uh, but there's one factor that's kind of inconsistent or actually very inconsistent is the fact that mutations are generally bad. And as it turns out, only 1% of mutations are actually beneficial. That increases the affinity of the B cell receptor. Uh, and for the most part, a lot of mutations are either lethal, it kills the B cell, or just makes the B cell worse. Um, and so what that means is because the, the best B cells will enter the dark zone, divide six, let's say six consecutive times without being checked, then a lot of the progeny cells experience one of two things. Either a bunch of them just die off due to lethal mutations, or a lot of them experience backsliding and affinity due to uh, dominant deleterious mutations. And so if we kind of make up a reasonable model that you can talk about offline if you're interested, um, and do a simulation, what you find is that for a, a reasonable value of a mutation rate that's obtained from experiments, um, out of uh, two to the six, so 64 possible progeny cells, only just over a third of them actually survive six, uh, six divisions. Um, as well as you see that a, there's a large fraction of B cells uh, that have actually decreased in their affinity compared to the parent cell. Um, and so clearly this is very counterproductive and a waste of you know, these rare high affinity B cells that kind of are generated in the germinal center. And so the solution that we propose to this is actually uh, quite uh, straightforward and it's basically that maybe there's a mechanism uh, to enhance or to vary the mutation rates depending on the relative affinity of the B cells within the germinal center. And so what that means is specifically that if we're able to decrease the mutation rate for the best B cells and and you'll have to also increase the mutation rate for the worst B cells to keep the experimental mutation rate constant because it's the, the measured mutation rate is an average. Uh, what happens is that in the case now the B cells are mutating um, less uh, frequently, 
uh, you see that uh, there's a, it fixes kind of both problems in the sense that there's a smaller proportion of B cells that are now experiencing this backsliding affinity, and also you almost get a doubling of the number of B cells uh, that are uh, maintaining the same affinity, the high affinity, as the parent cell. Okay. And without going into too much detail, I think the best way to gain intuition for this is to borrow some ideas from evolutionary hill climbing in ecology. And so if you, let's say you have your germinal center um, and you uh, bin or classify your B cells into these affinity groups, you'll see this population uh, distribution. Um, and due to the selection through T cell signaling and antigen acquisition, depending on the relative affinity, the B cells will experience deterministic growth. And so things, so the B cells that are relatively high affinity will grow, B cells with relatively low affinity will die off deterministically. But in the rare case that you do get a, the best, uh, like even better B cell, uh, it will experience stochastic drift until it um, really hits this critical population called the establishment population. As it turns out, because the germinal center is kind of in this range of small population, it's about a couple thousand B cells, um, the rate limiting factor in this uh, wave of your population evolving to a higher affinity is actually uh, the time to establishment of the nose of your population. And, and essentially what lowering this mutation rate does is it allows you to clone this best B cell as fast as possible, therefore decreasing this establishment time. Okay. And so, again, we can throw this into an uh, agent-based model, and what, what we find is that this, uh, having this uh, affinity-dependent uh, mutation rate and B cell in the germinal center uh, greatly increases the rate of affinity maturation. The affinity, overall affinity increases much faster in the constant case, as shown in this graph here. Um, but the real question now is, okay, how do we actually test this experimentally? So as it turns out, one characteristic thing you observe with this decreasing mutation rate model um, is this long tail in, in, the, in the, in if you take a probability distribution of the size of identical B cells, because you're allowing these low mutation fast bursts of B cells, you expect to see a lot of large uh, identical B cell populations. And, and that's how you get this long tail compared to the constant mutation rate case. And so in order to check that, we uh, part teamed up with our collaborators, Julian Rippenschlager and um, Michelle Nusenzweig at Rockefeller. And they had this really, uh, cool mouse system. Um, they did a bunch of complicated things I don't fully understand. Um, but at the end of the day, what they found was that, uh, in fact, within mice systems, uh, in vivo, if you take out and sequence uh, germinal center B cells throughout the course of uh, affinity maturation, you do indeed find these very large uh, clusters and bursts of identical B cells with high affinities as expected. And on top of that, if you kind of do a similar histogram, in this case, it's the cumulative distributive function. But either way, you do uh, recover this very long tail behavior that you would expect with uh, decreased mutation rate for these highly um, proliferating B cells. And finally, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but um, they also came up with a pretty interesting mechanism. And to go in short, the actual, uh, how, how the B cell receptors acquire mutation is through this enzyme called AID, uh, which only operates during the G1 part of the cell cycle. And so as it turns out, the best B cells that require this maximum amount of T cell signal divide more, but they also go through cell cycle much faster, uh, as fast as four hours for an entire cell cycle, which is incredibly fast. Um, and so what happens is that, as it turns out, because AID can only act during G1, if you decrease the time spent in G1, it just automatically decreases the mutation rate because there's physically less time for AID to act and cause point mutations. Um, and yeah, and with that, I'd just like to summarize, again, um, kind of going against this uh, common belief that the mutation rate is constant. As it turns out, reducing mutation rate for best B cells is theoretically should enhance affinity maturation. And the intuition was that you want to bank the good cells uh, before gambling through mutations, because generally mutations are going to make your cells worse. Um, and then we had some experimental verifications of our predictions, and we find that we find these large bursts of clones of B cells for high affinity um, B cells. And, and on top of that, there was, a, uh, there, there was some experimental evidence that the um, the mutation rates are uh, enforced through this cell cycle modulation. And so with that, I'd like to thank my advisor, uh, Ned Wingreen, as well as our collaborators, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. And we have a question. I guess I had two questions. One is, I mean, how does the cell know it's to speed up its cell cycle rate? If you, I mean, you explain the mechanism, but, you know, you just 
made the question one level higher in the hierarchy. How does a cell, you know, in other words, the affinity match, the affinity match is done by, you said, the T cell signal yeah. that comes in and basically makes more of those cells. Uh -huh. But how does, is that, that also speeds up the cell cycle depending on? Yeah, so it, it's very related to the T cell signaling. So as it turns out, the magnitude of T cell upregulates a transcription factor called CMIC. Uh, and through CMIC, uh, it directly controls the cell cycle um, time. So it's, it's so, the ones that interact with the T cells more get speed, speed up their cell cycle. Yeah, more and also just receives larger doses because they're presenting higher um, density of peptides, yeah. And the other question is, it's all great to lower the mutation rate, but can you also reconcile that with the actual increase in affinity that you get at the end of the day? I mean, you said you get a hundredfold increase of infinity, which presumably is happening due to the affinity maturation, but now you're sort of working against that because you're lowering the mutation yeah. rate of the ones that have the best chance to actually mature. Yeah, so, 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 so yeah, can, so that's is that uh, consistent? To yeah, so, so that's an interesting point. Yeah, definitely if you lower the mutation rate too much and you're not mutating, then yeah, you're, you're stopping it. But at the same time, there's kind of this optimal point where you're maximizing or you're minimizing this establishment time so that in the case that you do generate a mutation or a uh, beneficial mutation, you're not wasting it by just kind of gambling it away with high mutation rates. Um, and so there is kind of this optimal middle point, I guess, is the point, yeah. Okay, thanks again, Andrew. <laughs> Next speaker is uh, Michaela Greiner. So today I'll be discussing some of my work on the role of momentum in T cell activation. So similar to um, actin and microtubules, momentum is a filamentous protein that forms a large network within the cell. And together these networks form the cytoskeleton, which is driving shape changes, movement, force generation, all of which are important for my area of research, which is T cell activation. So T cells are part of the adaptive immune system and they identify and respond to specific invaders. Um, and this identification happens upon um, encountering a very specific antigen, which are usually presented on the surface of specialized immune cells. And you can see an example of this interaction in the video below, where here we have our T cell in green, and then a target cell shown in um, blue. And so as this region of contact forms between the two cells, you can see um, polarization of the T cell, as long as spreading along the uh, target cell surface. Um, this polarization can be marked by movement of certain structures towards the region of contact, um, such as the centrosome, which is marked here in red. Um, so these processes do depend on activity of the cytoskeleton, such as actin and microtubule dynamics near the immune synapse, and these have been relatively well studied over time. Um, but less is known about the role of vimentin in this process. And so we do know at least that vimentin is important for other immune cells, such as B cells or cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And the role of our research is to study Vimentin's role in T cell activation, so characterizing its dynamics near the synapse and then investigating which structures might modulate its dynamics. And so initially what we did is captured confocal videos of Vimentin near the immune synapse. On the left, what you're looking at is a cell on a non-activating surface um, whose Vimentin network seems to fluctuate a little bit but not exhibit large-scale changes in structure. Whereas on the right-hand side, we have a vimentin network that seems to contract inwards over time. Um, and we've noticed this vimentin contraction in activated T cells pretty consistently on activated surfaces. Um, so these differences are captured through some of our initial analysis, where essentially we're measuring distribution of vimentin around a central center of mass-like point. Um, we have also noticed that in these activated cells, you'll notice that the centrosome marked in yellow tends to move down towards the site of vimentin contraction. This does not happen in the non-activated cells. And so to some extent, we've been investigating relationships between vimentin contraction and centrosome polarization. Um, towards that end, we've been looking to see whether these processes might be driven by similar um, structures. 
in particular the motor protein dynein, um, which is known to drive centrosome polarization. If you inhibit dynein, it appears that this um, fermenting contraction doesn't appear. You see similar levels of um, low fluctuations, but not sort of that contraction that you see in other activated cells. Um, so, moving from time. Uh, we also have investigated the um, structure of these networks relative to each other. It appears that vimentin and microtubules tend to form complementary networks with vimentin towards the center of the immune synapse and microtubules more towards the outside. Here we're looking at vimentin in magenta and microtubules in blue. Um, and just to give a sample of more work that we've done in general, we've also looked at um, relationships between the microtubule network as well as vimentin. Um, Perturbing one of these networks appears to affect the function of the other as well as its structure, such as depolymerization of microtubules, inducing the formation of strange fermentin aggregates near the top of the cell instead of forming nice contracted networks near the bottom. Um, it also appears that knocking down vimentin can affect microtubule growth near the synapse, which is an important part of activation. Um, in addition to this, we're interested in factors such as signaling, ectomycin, contractility, and the role of vimentin in all of these factors. Um, so in conclusion, we've noticed that fermentin appears to contract at the immune synapse and that this contraction requires activity of dynein and may be associated with centrosome polarization. Um, we've done some preliminary research into fermentin and microtubules and how they might form complementary interacting networks in these activated cells. Um, and to conclude, I'd just like to thank my lab and sources of fun. Thanks. Big question. We have no question. I think we can go on with the uh, next talk. Thanks again, Michael. Next speaker will be Antoine Aragon. Antoine Aragon. Um, today I'll be telling you a bit about part of my uh, PhD project done with uh, Alexandra Valjak, Thierry Mora, Amory Lambert uh, on learning evolutionary parameters from allelic trees. So when an antigen invades a host, an immune response is triggered. And at the level of the adaptive immune system, we have B cells that begin proliferating and mutating under selective pressure in a process called affinity maturation, which Andrew uh, introduced in depth. Um, there's basically two ways of representing this process. The first is through something called a cell lineage tree, which contains information about all the births and all the mutations that occurred during the process, as well as the times at which they occurred. All right. Unfortunately, um, when we study affinity maturation, we, in general, don't have access to all this information. In general, what one will do is um, we'll sample a set of B cells from a host at a given time, and from these, infer uh, an allelic tree, which is um, the phylogeny of all the unique alleles that were part of the sample. Right, and this is a um, much reduced version of the cell lineage tree, and it, it doesn't have in, any information about the times. Um, so this lack of information becomes an issue when one wants to learn something, some properties about the underlying biological process, right? And since it's the long-term goal of my PhD to detect signatures of selection in allelic trees from affinity maturation, then it becomes necessary to kind of bridge the gap between these two representations and recover some of the information that we lost uh, that isn't present in the allelic tree. Um, so at the moment, we, uh, we've done this, but in the case of neutral mutation. So right now, we have a method that will infer evolutionary parameters from some synthetic allelic trees, so allelic trees that we create ourselves, in the case of neutral mutations. So a bit about how we do this. 
Um, so to model the biology, we consider some birth-death models uh, with a birth rate lambda and a death rate mu, which can both depend on time. And we'll generate some reconstructed cell trees from this uh, using the models. Then we spread neutral mutations on them through some Poisson point process with uh, a rate theta. Um, then we can collapse any cell tree that we generate into its corresponding allelic tree by deleting um, any of the branches in the cell tree that have zero mutations on them. Um, and losing any information with respect to time. So in the allelic tree now, all of the branches have lengths which are proportional to the number of mutations on them. Um, right, so this is our starting point, this allelic tree, and we kind of want to go back and infer the parameters that created the cell tree. And briefly, how we do this is we maximize, we do maximum likelihood on this object here, so the probability of the cell tree, given the evolutionary parameters, summed over all the cell trees that are compatible with the allelic tree. And we have a way of doing this that's extractable, but I, if you'd like to know more, I can tell you after. Um, and to show you a few results, uh, so if we try to infer, for example, the birth rate knowing the, uh, the death rate and the mutation rate for do this a bunch of times for uh, different sets of IID um, of independent 100 allelic trees, right? So we get, that's the blue histogram, the result of all the simulations. The mean is per basically perfectly agrees with, with the true value of the, of the birth rate. So we have kind of an unbiased estimator for the birth rate. Similarly, we have an unbiased estimator for the, for the mutation rate. And if we try to do both at once, uh, every dot here is the result of a simulation. We also have an unbiased estimator for both. Uh, it's like a parabola. It's like uh, nice and has a nice well-defined peak. Um, I think it's much broader in uh, if one tries to infer the death rate. The death rate is generally, the likelihood is very flat in that case, but for the, for the mutation rate and the, the, the birth rate, it's, it's quite nice, like a well-defined maximum. Thanks again, Antoine. <laughs> session is uh, Maria Francesca Bate with a talk about identification of uh, antigen-specific B cell receptor. Thanks. Okay. Um. Hi, everyone. I'm Maria Francesca Bate. And um, today I'm going to talk about my PhD project that I'm doing uh, at Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris under the supervision of Alexandra Balchak and uh, Thierry Mora. And it will be about the computational detection of uh, antigen-specific B cell using a pipeline called STAR. So, uh, okay, now I think you got uh, how the immune system works after all these nice talks, especially after the very clear talk of Andrew, you know uh, everything about uh, affinity maturation. Let's briefly just recap that uh, when a host is exposed to an antigen that can be represented by a virus, a bacteria, or a vaccine, uh, there is an immune response that is triggered at the level of P cells. This means that they proliferate and mutate. And I guess uh, everyone uh, is aware of that now. And uh, this mutation allows them to recognize better and better the antigen and eventually uh, protect ourselves. So at the level of data, uh, what we can do is that we can take uh, a sample of blood of these uh, immunized patients. And then we end up with this list of, uh, of, of sequences. 
uh, that uh, are very nice, but uh, also very hard to, to analyze, because when, you're, when we are working with this kind of data, uh, we are facing a huge repertoire of different receptors, and uh, only a few of them are actually effective against a specific pathogen. So uh, my goal in my PhD project is uh, to detect them, so to detect computationally uh, this antigen-specific re receptor using uh, only one time point. So uh, briefly, I just want to present the data that I used uh, in order to build the pipeline. They belong to a public data set of uh, five humans that are vaccinated against uh, flu vaccine in 2008. And I have longitudinal data, so I have sample of blood um, before vaccine and uh, after vaccine. And in particular, I will focus my analysis only on the CDR3 of the heavy chain. And uh, who is not familiar with this kind of nomenclature, I will just remind you briefly the structure of the antibody that is the same structure of the receptor that is at the surface of the B cell. And uh, uh, what's important for us to know is just that there is a constant region and a variable region that is called the VDJ region because it's formed by some uh, gene segments uh, that are the V gene segment, the D gene segment, and the J gene segment. And in particular, as you can see, the CDR3 um, start at the end of the V gene and finish at the beginning of the J gene. This means that uh, is the most variable region of this already variable region. Um, that's why we're going to focus on that because uh, this variability is, is the one that really gives the specificity to the receptor, and so is the, inter the interesting one that uh, actually then drives the, the, the bonding with the antigen. So, um, which are the features uh, that we decided to study? Uh, so, uh, we decided to focus on nearest neighbors. Uh, why, first of all, I mean, can be reasonable to just think that uh, since during the immune response, the one that react to the antigen start to proliferate and mutate, we will end up with this big, dense cluster of similar sequences, so we won't something to detect uh, this expansion of this um, highly connected cluster. And then what is our definition of neighbor? Uh, we're going to start with the two sequence um, in amino acid. These are two CDR3 amino acid. Um, we will define neighbors, uh, the one that are just one amino acid away. And then we will add uh, a multiplicity uh, that is defined as the number of distinct nucleotide sequences that are in the data set that will translate for that amino acid sequence. So in this example, the sequence on the top will end up with four neighbors. So uh, we can see uh, here some uh, um, comparison of different features uh, that we can find, because one can argue, okay, let's just, uh, if you know that uh, the, the, the B cell will proliferate, just take uh, the one with the highest frequency in the sample, and that will be the one that reacts to that to the vaccine. But it turns out that the frequency alone, it's not always a good feature to discriminate for this uh, antigen-specific cell because, as you can see, uh, it doesn't actually change over time the distribution of frequency. So, and in particular, if you look at the tail, uh, that is the one that are more, more interesting for us because uh, they are the sequence with the highest frequency, they kind of overlap for day zero and day seven. Instead, if we look at the same distribution for neighbors, uh, we can really see a shift at day seven. So it's kind of natural to just put a threshold somewhere there and isolate all the sequences that are above this, this threshold and consider them as good candidates to be antigen specific. But now you can argue that at the beginning I told you that I want to do this using only one time point. And in order to put this threshold, I need to know the distribution of day zero. So of course, if we want to get rid of these days and just focus at the peak of the infection that for flu is day seven, uh, we need to parameterize anal model. So the model is very simple, uh, is based on some generative model that compute the probability of occurrence of any sequence and is based of, on the biological process that actually produce um, the, the sequence. And then, I mean, it's straightforward to um, compute the expected value of number of neighbors uh, of a given sequence in a patient that is not immunized. And that will be just the sum of the probability of generation of all the sequences belonging to the ensemble of neighbors of our given sequence. So we just work with, the, oops, there's no, 
there's no plot. Okay, I will, uh, I will, I will uh, try to um, explain it anyway. So we just work uh, with an approximation, and now I want you to imagine there is a nice, very nice plot there that uh, actually it's like um, uh, this one that we see before. So it's the distribution of the zero of number of neighbors, and then there is the distribution of the null model that uh, um, very nice uh, kind of overlap the distribution of the zero. So the null model uh, predicts well the distribution of number of neighbors uh, of the zero. And then, I mean, if you're interested, in, I have it on my laptop and I can show you. So um, yeah, so now we don't need for the zero anymore. We can just use the null model and we can briefly uh, summarize the pipeline. So we compute the neighbors uh, of each sequence within the data set, then we infer the threshold using this generative model, uh, and then above the threshold we do some filtering for, to remove sequencing errors, and we end up with this nice, uh, dense cluster of, um, of sequences that are good candidates for us to be antigen-specific. So we can look at some um, uh, results. Uh, if we apply, uh, apply the pipeline to the different days, what we can see is that there are no hits or no sequences that are detected at the day uh, before vaccination. And this is very good. And uh, in particular, then we can uh, focus even more on uh, just the first patient because uh, the hits of uh, the first patient were tested experimentally. And they turned out to be the one with the highest affinity with the, with the flu vaccine uh, within the, the set of antibodies that were tested in this experiment. Um, they correspond to the point in green there that uh, have the highest affinity to the vaccine. And then we said, okay, since now we have some experimental validation that it is actually working, let's look into these sequences. If we can tell something about the biological process that actually produced them. And so uh, we looked in, into the same cluster that I showed you before of the first patient, and we check for the V-gene usage. So if you remember, at the beginning, I showed you the, the structure of an antibody. And uh, uh, in particular, I told you that um, the V-gene is the, the segment that is right before the CDR3. So, um, and it's also very long. It's really unlikely that if different um, uh, sequence are found uh, with different V genes, uh, they can come from the same ancestor. So it's actually impossible. So uh, there was a hint here of some pressure, some convergent selection that was acting uh, on this cluster. And uh, in particular, then we went further and uh, we inferred the lineage trees associated with the same cluster. And here the color code is, uh, means same amino acid. Uh, CDR3. Uh, and so again, this was uh, very nice because then we inferred the, these lineage trees and we actually saw some structure and uh, the, some overlap between these different lineages. Um, if we focus uh, on uh, uh, the first uh, amino acid uh, sequence, uh, so an only one amino acid sequence, uh, and uh, we look for um, the trajectory of only this amino acid sequence uh, uh, through time, we can see that uh, all the nucleotide sequences that are associated with this amino acid sequence uh, independently expanded through time. And in particular here, the different color are different V genes, so uh, there is really a hint of something's going on, so some different ancestor that uh, under some selection pressure arrived to the same uh, amino acid CDR3. And that was very surprising for us. So I just wanna leave you with the take home message that is a um, quote by Ratatouille itself that said that uh, not everyone can become uh, a great receptor, but a great receptor can come from anywhere. Uh, that just means, in other words, that different B cells under selection pressure can bring uh, to the same uh, antigen specific receptor. And I would like to thank you. Question for Maria?
I mean, uh, do you mean if I try to infer these kind of neighbors, uh, not at the level of sequence, but uh, uh, at the entire data set? I don't Yeah. What is the correlation between Yeah, the problem is that uh, the CDR3 sequence uh, are not very long. So uh, if you uh, increase the threshold at the level of amino acid, uh, at some point you will end up with just one big cluster for the entire data set. It will not give you any information. Actually, but then what we tried that I'm not sure it's similar to the, um, your um, your question uh, is that we try to infer uh, like to to compute a metric for neighbors uh, um, in terms of lineages. So we infer all the lineages of the data set, uh, and uh, uh, we define some pairwise distance between the lineages, uh, and we looked for neighbors in terms of lineages, uh, but uh, that didn't give us uh, any signal. If we compare then day seven with day zero, s that didn't give us any signal. It means that really mm, the convergence selection uh, is there, but uh, it's not so strong uh, to actually work only at the level of, of lineages, like without the remo like removing the information of, of mutations. Okay, if there are no other questions, I think uh, we can conclude uh, this session. Thanks again, Maria.